uh, today we've got, uh, the topic is gonna be small grains and small grains production. We've got two guests on today to kind of help facilitate the discussion. Uh, Jared Goplin and Joachim Wiersma. They recently uh, finished a tour of the state uh, hosting some small grain production meetings. So they've been out and uh, very much in tune with what farmers are asking the questions uh, that are up and out there. Um, but that said, uh, this is your opportunity to uh, ask questions of these guys and help facilitate discussion. So we wanna say thank you to you for participating today to kind of help uh, lead the show and, uh, and have a discussion here uh, this morning. So that said, we do have some questions that came in at registration time and we can go through all of those as well as uh, anything that's new that comes in. Uh, and just as a highlight there, I know this is becoming an old hat for folks that have participated in the past. Um, there's a Q&A uh, icon. If you hover over kind of the, the bottom part of your screen, you can click on the Q&A box and put your questions in there uh, so that we can kind of keep tabs on what questions are coming in and uh, make sure they get answered uh, as they appear. Uh, that said, uh, we do have the chat function too. So we will be putting links into the chat function as well as that's uh, the area. If you were having any kind of technical difficulties, uh, please uh, go over to the, the chat box and uh, type in uh, concerns there or anything that might be popping up. Uh, so that said, I'm Ryan Miller. I'm going to be moderating this morning's session, uh, filling in for Dave Nikolai, who had a meeting that was postponed due to the snowstorm yesterday. Uh, so he'll be on the road, um, but uh, I'll be filling in for that. Do you want to say thank you to our sponsors, both the Minnesota Corn and Minnesota Soybean Research Promotion Councils for helping facilitate today's meetings. Uh, with that, I want to introduce uh, Jared and Yoakum. Good morning, everyone, and thanks, Ryan. Uh, I do find it a little bit funny we're talking about small grains and the corn and soybean growers uh, sponsored it. But I think, uh, you know, that's one thing we learned last week when we were on the road is uh, there's some issues with corn and soybean production. So it does kind of make sense, uh, you know, having that third crop. And of course, there's all kinds of questions with the markets nowadays and what's going on and, and what's going to happen uh, going into next year. So good to be here. Excellent, guys. And say, kind of to kick things off, one of the questions that really stuck out at me is uh, having seen you guys speak and talk about small grains on a number of occasions, uh, it pertains to your first commandment of, of growing small grains in, in Minnesota. And, and that uh, would be here, can I plant small grains after corn? You can get quite the reaction earlier when I asked <laughs> that question. I mean, I know the okay, answer, I, but- Okay, I'll, I'll tone it down. Okay. I will still take anybody, uh, you know, my career has been, the big red line in my career has been fusarium head blight. And so whether you call it PTSD or whatever you want to call it, I want to avoid the risk of fusarium head blight to the largest extent possible, which means that um, as, as the commandment goes, you know, or, you know, do not plant any small grains after corn, period. Okay, of course, then you have to have an exception if you do, please do it after silage corn. And, and the rationale is, is very simple. Um, Fusarium head white is stock rot in corn. And as those corn plants senesce, even though the corn breeders have always done a marvelous job in preventing or, or seeing damages to, due to stock rot, the moment that plant senesces, that stover becomes an excellent uh, feeding ground for Fusarium graminearum. And so we're never short of inoculum after corn, which means that one of the three, one, th one of the three corners in the disease triangle is already stacked. Plain and simple. So you're setting yourself up for a failure as opposed to success. Yes. And, and if we talk about farming as far as risk management, and if we then make the analogy, which is a rather crude one, that farming is like praying Russian roulette every single year, um, I'd rather not have two bullets in the six shooter. I'd like to minimize the number of bullets in that six shooter. I, that's a good way to put it. So say uh, another question that came up here and uh, Kind of the elephant in the room here is with current crop prices and input prices, we know everything is really escalated right now. 
The question is about hard red spring wheat and uh, how does it become competitive with corn and soybeans? And, you know, I think um, at least when I saw your meeting this, this winter, I know Jared, you kind of talk about some of these kind of outside benefits that I think a lot of the small grain growers, particularly Yoakum in your part of the state, they, they might take for granted that uh, when we're in a more um, limited rotation, there's, there's some challenges that happen. So Jared, I know you've, you've kind of answered this before and maybe you want to take a stab at it. Yeah. So I actually just pulled up the spreadsheet and, uh, you know, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into that. I think it'll probably take too much time, but um, <clears throat> you know, we've, we've talked about crop rotation benefits and the whole uh, kind of rotation effect um, when we're planting crops into rotation versus, you know, continuous corn. That's where a lot of the discussion, you know, especially 10 years ago went on, you know, what's the yield drag for continuous corn versus corn soybean. And, uh, and there's actually, you know, an even bigger yield bump um, on a lot of the, the longer uh, rotation studies if you have a third crop in the rotation. So if you're growing corn, soybeans, and, and wheat, or another small grain, um, you can kind of figure, you know, like a, an 8% yield bump, give or take, in both soybeans and corn when you grow it in a three-year rotation. So when you have that third crop in the rotation. You know, and then we talk about, uh, you know, weeds, resistant weeds, and uh, corn rootworms. You know, that's been another topic that comes up. Some pockets of the state have really been struggling with corn rootworm. And, you know, you basically have to get away from, from corn or even a corn soybean rotation, depending on what your, your situation is there. So, so there is some other benefits there as well. Um, you know, so over the life of the rotation, really current prices, you know, it's kind of a similar uh, over the life of the rotation, let's say we're going corn soybean rotation versus a, a corn soybean wheat rotation. Um, you know, over the course of that three year period, it's going to be a pretty similar uh, net return per year right now, the way prices are. But of course, you are going to have a little bit lower returns in that small grain year um, just because, um, you know, the way the way the, the prices work out and everything. But you will have a little bit of a yield bump in the future years. Now, I just plugged in just for fun as I saw that question come in. Now, what about in the wheat year uh, specifically? So if we just talk about, you know, individual crops and not about a rotation, um, if we have a $11 wheat and can grow 70, 70 bushel wheat in Southern Minnesota, we'll be about the same as, as what we figure for corn and soybeans right now. And that's figuring, um, you know, pretty close to what uh, new crop prices are, are right now. So, you know, we have a little bit of way, a little ways to go, but, you know, there's a lot of variables, uh, you know, in, in, in Europe with the, with the Ukraine and Russia situation and, and all kinds of variables there. Um, you know, so depending on what happens, you know, we might see $11 wheat. And in that case, you know, we'd be a similar, similar break even. And I know oats has been another hot topic lately, you know, as oat prices have, have gone way up and, you know, oil prices and Canadian drought and all kinds of variables going to those prices as well. Um, that has a lot of people kind of wondering about oats and, uh, you know, that's kind of a similar, similar, uh, similar equation there. I mean, if you can get, you know, $8 oats, $7 oats, um, you know, it, it would, would be very competitive with corn and soybeans. And you will see some of those other rotation benefits that you might not uh, know how to quantify. So since we're click and clack, um, and we're trying to, you guys are trying to stomp us. Um, I have an old rule of thumb for small, uh, basically spring wheat to be competitive with corn and beans. Uh, wheat has to be twice the price of corn and two thirds the price of beans to fit in the mix. And the dilemma that every single producer has, has basically is cash flow on enterprise basis versus the agronomics of a rotation and the advantages. So when we talk about rotational advantages, your banker goes, we don't care. But there is that opportunity cost. That's, that's basically what Jared is referring to. You are only going to get that 8%, not when you plug that number into your spreadsheet, but when you actually rotate the crop. Uh, we have water savings, and that's without savings on seed cost with triple or quadruple stacks, uh, anything technical to solve some of our production challenges in corn and beans. And so... Yeah, I, are, I recognize that I will always be the black sheep in the family and that the whole world would want to be corn at the current prices, but we are starting to bang our head against the wall in some of the dimensions that are called farming, whether that's herbicide-resistant weeds, whether that's extended diapause corn woodworm, uh, 
the, the disappearance of basically cheap organophosphates uh, to, to solve some of these problems, we need rotations. So if we kind of transition that a little bit, maybe um, outside of the, the rotation aspect of things, maybe let's, let's focus in on oats and, uh, and uh, maybe just start addressing a little bit. There were several questions that came in around oat, and oat production and, you know, what should someone be thinking about if, well, this oat price looks attractive, I want to give it a shot. Okay. Um, first, see if you can find seed because that's going to be a challenge uh, and you might have to go further than you think to find uh, seed. Then um, the, the, the second commandment in oat production really is, or any small grain product, plant as early as possible. I like Jared's, uh, uh, basically you have to have your planter ready by Easter, uh, if not by uh, St. Patty's Day and be ready to go. Now, the problem with that is that a lot of your co-ops, if you need to apply fertilizer, they haven't woken up yet. And I would actually plant and apply the fertilizer afterwards if they're not ready when the ground is ready for you to go. Uh, then we have to worry about weed control. And if we have a good competitive stand um, that is relatively simple, we can get in, because one of the challenges with oats is uh, it's very competitive but we have no options really for grass control. Uh, we can use Callisto, but that means the grasses have to be really small for them to get some control. Um, and then the biggest thing after that really is you have to watch for crown rust and scout it and be willing to use fungicides. Even though we provide ratings for crown rust resistance, uh, simply because of the disease cycle, having the ultimate post uh, across the landscape, uh, we can see changes in crown rust severity on varieties uh, very locally. And we have to manage that because that's the fastest way to lose test weight. And the millers want test weight. Uh, plain and simple, because it's going to go for human consumption, most of it. And... For milling yields, uh, test weight is the proxy for quality. And so we want to protect that test weight to the best possible, which means keep the crown rust out of it. And then we can get into harvest, and depending on the variety, there is some uh, details like stay green and cutting it at 18% uh, rather than waiting for the whole canopy to dry down and risking discoloration in the grain and uh, losing test weight, et cetera. And then there's another uh, comment I just saw come in about, about knowing your market before you even get the seed, which I think is a valid point because, uh, you know, oats, you know, has gotten a lot of attention lately, but, you know, getting an oat bid right now can be a challenge because some of the, you know, the places that, uh, that buy oats typically uh, have enough, either have enough contracted or uh, currently aren't looking. So, um, you know, that is, that is an important variable. And then the other thing is wherever it's going to go, you know, what is the test weight? You know, do you need to have good test weight uh, or are you feeding it yourself? I know we've had a few people this last week uh, on our small grain tour that are actually going to plant oats that have just been buying them to feed uh, in recent years. Um, and now with oat prices the way they are, they're going to grow some of their own so that they can, you know, save on some of those, those feeding costs, um, you know, where test weight might not be as important. Whereas when you're selling it to a miller, you know, obviously that's a, you know, a potential rejection there. So making sure you you know, get the combine set and all those other lots of details that uh, go into test weight and all the fun that comes with growing oats, if you want to call it fun. <laughs> okay, so, so, so Ryan, can I jump in and quickly answer these three questions that came into the Q&A? Yep. Um, do, does a dry start of the growing season, or dry growth, you know, the dry season favor small grains? Yes. Um, if you, as you go further west, um, they migrate out of corn and beans and go to small grains. Why? Because overall, small grains use less water in a season. Now, that doesn't mean that they're more efficient with water, but they use the water in part of the season and they 
uh, earlier in the season. And if we don't get summer rains, they can finish. Uh, corn is actually much more efficient with water than the small grains are. Uh, you need for an 80 bushel crop in the Red River Valley, we need about 12 inches of available water. If we have some stored in the soil profile, we only need a couple of rains to make it happen. Uh, oats is pretty similar. So that's as far as dry seasons, yes. Is it worthwhile to control buckthorn uh, in soybeans? Well, it's, it's, it's worthwhile to get rid of buckthorn across the landscape for different reasons, one of them being crown rust and oats. And yes, you also reduce the habitat for soybean aphids. Uh, is there an app uh, to determine what small grains would be best for your own operation rotation schedule? I, it, maybe I'm the app or Jared is the app. We have that spreadsheet that Jared talked about that, we, that includes the rotational benefits that you can, and we can share that spreadsheet with you to plug in. Um, but when it comes to your individual situation, as far as your soil types, what your existing rotation is, I'm probably the best app there is. Um, and Jared, we can walk you through scenarios. So just pause for a second, Joachim. What do you think is the best way to get some of those resources out to these folks? Do we want, do you guys have that spreadsheet and some of those resources posted somewhere or should we send a blanket email to folks that registered for today's workshop? What, what do you vote on there? Because you're going to refer to some of these, that spreadsheet and things and you can tinker around on your own with that. What do you guys want to do? Yeah, and we've actually talked about posting a crop news article. Um, okay. So maybe that'd be the best, uh, best follow up with that. Is, is yeah, uh, kind of keep your eyes on crop news, subscribe to the crop news blog, and uh, we'll probably post an article talking a little bit more about this just because there is there has been a lot of questions. And and uh, at the end of the day, it really comes down to your operation and, and what makes sense and, and all those types of things. So basically, it's just kind of a, an enterprise budget <clears throat> spreadsheet where you can enter in your input costs of different crops. It predicts what your yield benefits are going to be long term, and uh, you can kind of play around with prices and, and yields and those types of things to figure it out for yourself. And, and, the and the huge difference in that spreadsheet is that it actually takes the rotational effects into account where any other uh, crop budget I've ever seen kindly ignores that. So you're talking about that 8% kind of bump that from the long-term research with crop rotations and such. So yeah. um, no, that's good. I think uh, crop news, that'd be a good way to get that out there. And I think one of the recommendations I've heard you make, Jared, is save a copy of the spreadsheet in case you mess it up so you can kind of start over and experiment with different numbers and whatnot. So take, keep your eyes on that. Uh, Joachim, there was one question here that we kind of missed, I think. It pertains about cover crops, do's and don'ts ahead of spring wheat. Um, so, so it depends on the species. We like to not have small grains in front of small grains, uh, especially if you establish those cover crops very, very early. And, and the rationale is that we have a chance to introduce aphids uh, and some other viruses, uh, basically some viral diseases, barley yellow dwarf, uh, wheat streak mosaic virus. And if the cover crop survives, and so say if we use uh, winter wheat, as a cover crop, and you would go straight into spring wheat, you would have to have a two week gap between killing the winter wheat and going to the seeding the spring wheat. That's two weeks too late to plant the spring wheat. So if you do a, if, you, if you're worried about, you know, to me, soybean stubble is the absolute uh, ideal Pre, you know, previous crop to any of the small grains, whether that's a winter cereal or a spring cereal. Um, in very dry seasons, that cover crop established very early uses up water that might become a limiting factor. Uh, cover crops are not the panacea for everything. And Yoakum, having kept eyes on one of your trials down here in Southeast, I, you know, one of the benefits of cover crops is having this soil cover early in the spring. And when those small grains, the spring seeded small grains get seeded in, they 
they generate ground cover quite quickly typically and and so it's you know you're drilling them in and so you've got that benefit from the crop you're planting as opposed to you know having to have a cover there necessarily so just i don't know another observation i mm -hmm. make a comment i guess yeah and i mean that's part, part two with your selection and when you're planting it you know if you've got a bunch of biomass let's just say you had you know two tons of biomass from a cover crop in the fall that died <clears throat> you know if that's gonna keep you out of the field in the spring for a week or two <clears throat> You know, that's, again, kind of pushing that planting date back, um, you know, avoiding the, you know, the, uh, the grass crops, you know, something like brassicas, you know, or, or other crops that will winter kill that, uh, you know, uh, break down really fast would be, be really the only options I would consider, I guess. Or just plant a winter cereal. Then, you know, that, you know that's in your, then that's your cover. There crop. you go. Yep. So maybe you guys want to talk a little bit about winter cereals. It sounds like a natural transition there. Um, do you want to cover some of the basics or some considerations there with, with winter cereals? So, so the, the two that I would consider winter hardy enough uh, are winter wheat and winter rye. There is an, the Minnesota, University of Minnesota just released their first winter barley, uh, uh, Equinox. It's, it's uh, Albert Lee seed has the exclusive license to it, I believe. Um, but I'm very good at killing winter barley yet uh, in Minnesota. Um, it, it does. It, hopefully, this this one is a little bit more winter hardy than the varieties we've tested in the past. Um, but you know, it's about risk management. Uh, the winter wheat should always be in a no-till situation because snow cover um, insulates that seedling very well. Four inches of snow is an absolute ph phenomenal uh, insulation blanket for winter wheat. And it's not that we are, our temperatures extreme are too, you know, even though it's minus 30 right now, winter wheat can actually handle that minimum temperature for a short while. Snow cover greatly reduces that crown temperature. The crown temperature is much higher with that snow cover. What kills winter wheat is our little spring thaws that are gonna happen two weeks from now. We have black soils, they warm up very quickly. And once the dormancy is broken, that's when you run greater risk of subsequent winter kill, if we go back into the deep freeze. And with winter rye, I haven't seen that happen yet, where I lose a stand in early spring where with winter wheat, I've seen that, especially in no-till situations because of in, in tilled situation, because in no-till, that snow cover stays around just a little bit longer and, and, and kind of evens out those temperatures uh, extremes that, we, that we're gonna face in basically the beginning of March. So there's a question that came in. What's the deal with hybrid rye? What's the deal with hybrid yeah. rye? Well, long story short, they work. It's, it's the European breeders in Germany and Poland have started to develop hybrid rye. Rye is the only cross-pollinating species. And so it was a, it's more amenable to make uh, first generation F1 hybrids. Um, they started about 25, 25, 30 years ago with the development of that. Uh, have it down to a pretty robust system and I started testing them in the winter of 14, 15. And so far they've been very competitive. If you compare it to the old open pollinated varieties, we see about a 30 to 40% yield bump. Um, and so we, we have field averages of 120 plus uh, in parts of the state. We're learning um and so there's things we need to research better to fit them even better in our you know in our production systems um to me i think it fits very well after soybeans again um and it's the question that we're we're bumping into now is where are we going to put all the rye and that's a that's a that's a question that's very early on I had conversations with, and to really change acreage, it has to be a, there has to be a feed market, and the swine market is the most obvious. Uh, there's trial feeding trials underway to 
prove basically uh, to, or to validate basically what the Europeans are saying about uh, rye and swine, and swine rations. And those numbers all come back the same. Uh, that's basically equivalent to corn. There's some animal health benefits uh, that are starting to get documented. And so it fits. Okay. Um, so the question that comes in here is ab about what variety of oats or wheat I should plant. I want to just mention one thing that where I've learned the most is listening to you guys uh, at our summer field days where you kind of walk around and look at different varieties and tell us you know, what some of the benefits or drawbacks might be to any particular variety. But in addition to that, we do have these variety uh, trial results. And I posted the link for the 2021 trials. I know you have a, a number of trials throughout the state. I don't know if you want to mention variety and variety selection or make some comments on that. Yeah, Joachim, do you have your uh, pick slide? It might be a, a chance to, uh, to share that at least quickly. And thanks for the plug, Ryan. We will uh, we'll be planning uh, field days again, really throughout the state. You know, we've got uh, what three or four different locations in southern Minnesota, all the way up through northern Minnesota and, and the Roseau area, and uh, working on getting a location even up in the northeast. So, um, really, we'll have uh, some locations throughout the state to, to actually come and you know touch and feel these varieties and and uh, and kind of get a better handle on what's what's going on there. Another reason to tune into crop news because those things are promoted. Uh, that's one of the easiest and cheapest ways for us to promote those uh, events. So again, kind of that June time frame for Southern Minnesota, I know. And yeah, typically that third week of June, uh, Northern Minnesota is typically in that like second ish week of July or third. So, and Yoakum okay. looks like you got your oats up here now. So I got the oats up right now. So very briefly, uh, if you, depending on who your buyer is, if you keep it on the farm, I see no problems with Antigo. Uh, but Antigo has smaller seed, which means you have a larger fraction of thins, which the uh, uh, food uh, or the mills won't like. I think the most all around right now are Rushmore and Pearl, with Rushmore ha probably having a little bit more potential for lodging. Uh, Warrior is probably a little bit better fit, maybe in the organic market. Range, if we get a very late season, uh, or if you want to establish uh, alfalfa, and Dion and Pearl as our workhorse varieties. Uh, Dion does slightly better north and runs a little bit into problems with test weight. Um, if it has a late season down south, Pearl is very all around. I've put that variability in test weight. It's, it's a good test weight variety. Uh, this is a, without getting into the details, I see a little bit more variability in the test weight compared to other varieties. The quality has nothing to do with the test weight. It has to do with a little bit higher oil content, uh, which means that the shelf life of your granola bar is not as long, which some of the buyers are starting to worry about. So the breeding goal uh, is to lower oil content, which is decreases the feed value if you would stay, keep it on the farm. So that's as far as the, I'll stop sharing quick on the oats and I'll pull up uh, and I didn't open that PowerPoint, well darn it. The rye, you guys, qu quick. You guys mentioned lodging. How, what things do you consider other than variety when you're man managing lodging as you're transitioning? So, 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 and that answers Roger Whipple's question about growth regulators in oats. Okay, there's basically only one product label, Palisade. The label rate for Palisade isn't high enough to really make a difference. So um, variety selection is your first step. Um, and after that, it's a little bit of keeping your fingers crossed, not having that 60 mile an hour straight line wind right at uh, heading, because that's when it's most, uh, most susceptible to lodging. What about uh, overdoing it on the nitrogen? Heavy manure ground is going to be a problem because I have no really good control over when that nitrogen is available. Uh, 
follow the NREX. Uh, it's the best chance. If you want to dial back your if very early planting, don't overseed. So really do know how many seeds per acre you're putting down. Don't go by the three plus bushels and the grain drill with worn wheels where you're actually seeding three and a half to four bushels. Okay, good pointers. So I'm gonna share the next screen for, let's see. Screen two. Yeah, and as, as you get that up, uh, Roger Whipler also put a comment in here about uh, talking to your seed suppliers early, you know, with some of the demand in oats uh, there. And I talked to some other, uh, some, um, some other folks last week, and that was the case. They've had a lot of demand for oats. So any of those good varieties, you know, some of those picks that Yoakum had talked about uh, are probably going to be gone unless you uh, speak for them really quickly. Okay. Everybody can see this one. This is basically all the rye varieties. Uh, other than the typo relative grain yield, this is three years of data. You see this group on the top there, that's the hybrids. Uh, Teo is probably uh, the most all around hybrid right now. Receptor is gonna be its replacement probably in the future. Uh, Bono and Brissetto have been in the marketplace longer. And then you go almost 30% down and you get the group of the grain varieties uh, like Danko, Hazlitt, Musketeer, Ryman, uh, Hazlitt, and then the, the more the forage type, Spooner, Gardner, and Elbon. And Elbon is the darling in Iowa for the cover crop industry. It's a very small seeded it, uh, variety. It came out of Oklahoma. It's a grazing type. So we'll stop that one. And then Frenchie is on. So now I have to pull up one more PowerPoint. I'll get to that in just a minute. And I do have to point out that he obviously knows you well enough to put the word quick in there. So uh, <laughs> the quick, the quick I'm working version. on it. Work with me here, please. <laughs> One of the things I guess I'll mention about the hybrids is, you know, there has been a lot of use of rye in the cover crop industry and hybrids are not meant for the cover crop industry. That's uh, kind of a whole different, different ball game there. So, um, you know, if you are just growing rye as a cover crop or, um, you know, to seed your own acres or whatever it might be, um, you know, that's where the, the open pollinated are still, still kind of where that's at. You know, we started a project this last, uh, last summer with uh, Devlin on some weed control stuff and the variety he chose was the ND Gardener. And it created some pretty, pretty good cover out there. We'll see how it does over the course of the winter here, but yeah. look good in fall. So spring wheat variety selection for Southern Min. Um, we keep Torgi and Washburn in the list. Uh, Torgi is a little bit more towards yield in the South. Linkert, kind of almost out of historical obligation and because of its straw strength. Um, we've taken Bowles out and Ingmar out and substituted McLeod in it uh, as a higher protein wheat. Um, it's a little bit weaker for Fusarium headlight than we like it to be. A nice all around wheat for the South is Valda, and a little bit higher yielding than uh, Torgi, and a little bit more consistent than Shelly. Uh, we keep 3530 around as a very nice balanced variety, a little bit weaker straw. And then we added also SY611CL2, which is a beyond, so a herbicide resistant wheat if, uh, for across the state because if you have a lot of problem with ACCA's wild oats, this is an uh, alternative. And for the rest, it's pretty decent and consistent genetics. Uh, as far it's a balanced variety that has been pretty consistent performer. Uh, one that fell really by the wayside that you may have heard of, uh, because last year with the drought, we had some really interesting surprises in the variety trials, uh, is Murdoch. So that resistant variety, Yoakum, that's a glyphosate resistance? No, it is a ALS chemistry uh, okay. in the same family as Pursuit. Uh, it's actually the same active ingredient, isn't it, Jared? I don't remember. I don't think so, but... It's, it's beyond. The, sure. the herbicide that's labeled is beyond. Oh, okay, okay. It's, it's, an, a, it's an ALS or an okay. SU. Sorry. All right, so... We kind of went through the variety of things. And one question here is fungicide. And I know that's a multi-pronged uh, 
discussion as far as when, and it varies a little bit on uh, what small grain we're talking about and what disease and whatnot. So you want to spend a little time talking about fungicide use in, in small grains. The question was how many applications do I need? As many as the crop demands. <laughs> so that that's, it depends basically is the other answer. So if we talk about oats, the two timings that you want to look for that are really the most important is flag leaf fully extended. If I see crown rust in the bottom of the canopy, um, I probably want to do an application at flag leaf already. If I don't see any crown rust, I automatically move it to uh, basically fully headed oats and use it then. If I look at barley, um, in barley, the because we've gone to two row barley and Pinnacle is a large portion of that acreage and it's getting replaced by Genesis, but even Genesis isn't that great. Uh, Pinnacle is extremely susceptible to net plots. If you grow Pinnacle, you, it, the story is almost the same as an oats. You watch for it in the bottom of the canopy. If it's at flag leaf, fully extended, you see it, you spray at flag leaf. If not, you automatically spray at fully headed oats. And then you are barley or uh, pinnacle. For the other ones, because they're a little bit less susceptible to net blotch, um, and because Don, so the, the, the byproduct of Fusarium heplite, um, or the, the toxin that the Fusarium heplite produces, is a very large disruptor in the malt and, brew and brewing. You use uh, an application at fully headed barley, Fix 10.5. And we can talk about products um, at a minimum for barley. It would probably be Pizarro or Caramba. And if you want a little bit more flexibility, you go to Moravis Ace. Um, in wheat, the early season at FIX 5 has become commonplace uh, because it, it, it's easy because you tank mixing it with the herbicide program. I'm not necessarily uh, always in favor of it. I want you to look for tan spot. And the reason is that we don't want to use these very cheap chemistries that are, still have efficacy and lose the efficacy because we're starting to select for resistance. The critter we're after is tan spot. That's the, the canary in the coal mine always in, in spring wheat and winter wheat. Uh, spring wheat, I should say, winter wheat is a separate story. In spring wheat, tan spot is the canary in the coal mine and tan spot is capable of overcoming the efficacy of those, uh, of the tilled, the propiconazole, the triosol chemistries. And so don't spray if you don't see it, then keep an eye on it. If you, and, and the crop scouts will, will report it. And so we'll report of it in crop news. If you see some stripe rust or leaf rust in the bottom of the canopy, depending on the variety and its, and its resistance reaction, there might be a point where we want to apply it at FIX 9, flagly fully extended. Most years we will not have to, and then we start looking at FIX 10.51. And then we really look at the overall disease picture and the risk models to say, yes, you need to use a fungicide. No, you don't need to use a fungicide. Um, and because we have fairly good genetics and we have very decent prediction models, uh, it's not a foregone conclusion that you spray as opposed to what I told you about the barley and the oats. And um, this year was a good example of that. Now, that doesn't mean you don't scout for aphids because that's where we got caught this past season. People didn't spray the fungicide and therefore the automatic add-on of the insecticide didn't happen. And we got caught with some aphids at high enough numbers that we probably should have treated those fields just for aphids. Winter wheat, that early application at FIX 5 is pretty much an automatic. 
Um, that's because most of the genetics, winter wheat genetics, are susceptible to tan spot. And there might be some powdery mildew rolling around in those fields too, depending on where you're at in the state. The five, the, the flag leaf application versus the heading application, uh, again, is very similar to what the story is in, in spring wheat. We need to know how, how much leaf rust and stripe rust is in the bottom of the canopy if we can postpone it to a fix 10.51 application. And then we look at the risk model for Fugerium head blight, whether or not we use Pujar or Caramba, go as high as maybe Moravis Ace or step back to generic follicure and really focus on just the leaf diseases and control of leaf diseases. All right, excellent summary there, Joachim. Uh, what about someone that might be considering a small grain just for, for forage production? Are there things to think about uh, in their management plan, things to maybe they can forgo if, if they're not going for, you know, that grain production? I guess I'll, I'll kind of start on that one. And it kind of depends on when you're planning to cut it. So, and it really depends on what livestock you're feeding, what kind of quality you want. You know, if you want something really high quality, you know, high in protein and energy, for like uh, lactating cows, you know, you know, kind of in that boot stage is when a lot of folks think about cutting and you're going to have upwards of 20% protein or better, um, pretty good energy. You know, if it's that early and the likelihood of you actually having uh, enough disease pressure, unless it was in there really early is probably lower, but if you're going to wait, you know, you've got beef cattle or you want to feed dry cows, you're going to cut it soft dough. That's one where, you know, there's obviously more time for things to kind of develop and uh, scouting is a little bit more important because if you do have crown rust and some of these other things that pop in there, um, you know, they will degrade quality and, and tonnage as well. Um, so it kind of depends on when you're planning to cut, but still scouting is still important. And, you know, that's one of the things I always use uh, 2019 as the example, uh, at least in a lot of areas of Southern Minnesota and other places, you know, there's a lot of prevented plant ground and people planted oats. Uh, that was when they changed the rules where you could harvest cover crops in a prevent plant situation as forage. And a lot of those didn't get pl planted until later in June. And we really learned that oats and uh, crown rust do not get along. And uh, you know, a lot of oats out there were very short and, and spindly, really not even enough to cut in some cases because the crown rust got so bad. And that's one of the reasons why planting early is still kind of the key. So I would say most of the management considerations are similar. Uh, you know, plant early, um, you know, some of the winter cereals, if, if you can get rye planted, um, you know, that might, might even make more sense um, in some cases, but then, you know, kind of whatever quality you're looking for, um, and then keep an eye, you know, scouting is still the key here because, uh, you know, regardless of what your end use is, uh, diseases can, can be a problem. And I guess the other thing I'll mention is, is in, in relationship to establishing alfalfa or other perennial forages after, after some of the small grains, I know there was a question I had saw, uh, come through about that. And, uh, you know, we had talked about that a little bit last week and, and that's, um, really one of my favorite ways to establish alfalfa. You know, if you're planting it in the spring, you know, typically you have more weed pressure, you know, some of those early emerging uh, weeds in the spring, uh, you might have to use herbicides. And then you're going to have about 50 to 60% of your total maximum yield that first year. So it's kind of a, you know, an establishment year. Whereas if we have some timely rains in the summertime, you know, so we plant, you know, small grains, some of the winter cereals that we could harvest maybe a little earlier would be, you know, better in some cases. But even some of the you know spring cereals that if you can get it harvested by early August and get a get get some alfalfa or alfalfa grass mix planted, you know by that 12th to 15th of, of August, you know we can typically get the six to seven weeks um, of growth out of the alfalfa before a killing frost. So, um, you know timely rain, you know this is kind of the key this year. You know with the the dry weather. Um, if you don't get any rain, that can be a, a risky uh, proposition, but most of the time we can, can get enough uh, rainfall to get those things going and, and you get kind of your first year maximum yield the next year. So I think there is kind of a fit there, but, um, but yeah, getting the, the crop off early is, is the key. So you're a proponent of, of a winter cereal followed by planting a forage is kind of what I heard or... Yeah, I mean, it all depends on what your, you know, objective, what your markets are, you know, it'll work with a, with a, a spring cereal as well. But um, as you get further north in the state, you know, you're getting it off earlier is, is definitely better. You know, if you get into that mid to late August timeframe, it's, it's uh, probably a little too risky. Okay. Uh, so there are a couple of variety questions. Uh, one that came through actually over on the chat side of things, Yoakum, is about Equinox uh, and whether it's a malting type. 
And uh, they were talking a little bit about uh, if it's facultative or if it's truly a winter variety. It is a facultative. Uh, Kevin Smith is doing some really interesting work uh, in his breeding program and purposely chose to go the facultative route, which basically means that if it doesn't meet its fertilization requirements, day length response takes over and it still will produce a uh, basically tiller or it produces a tiller and then a head. It will go to stem elongation and produce seed. Um, that doesn't necessarily, and, and that maybe is somewhat surprising. Um, winter hardiness and the vernalization requirement are not that well correlated. So winter hardiness is, is the vernalization genes impart some winter hardiness, but it's not the whole story. So you can have a facultative winter of barley that actually is quite winter hardy. As far as the question of the malting characteristics, I have to defer that, I'll answer that later. I believe it is not halfway bad. Uh, and <laughs> better than, you know, it's still not what, where the, where the six rows are or the, the, the two rows are, but it's not halfway bad. I don't think AMBA has endorsed it yet. I don't know if there's actually been any uh, plant scale of what we call plant scale testing of it in the malt house, in the brew house. All right, so another variety question. Uh, what's the best variety? And now they're not putting in here what grain they're talking about, but on heavy ground in the southwest part of the state. Fine, heavy. Well, you know, like what you're used to, only further south. Basically anything. I don't think the variety selection really changes. Just those tenants don't follow corn and plant it early for spring yes. cereals? Yes. Okay. Um, then there's a question here. Being a little on the dry side in Norman and Monoman County, what seeding rate would you shoot for for Torgi? Um, would it be best to cut back some? No, uh, I would stay at that right now at that one point, one and a quarter million life, you know, seedlings per acre. So you bump it up with 1.3 million live seeds per acre. Planting date is more important than, than um, Torgi pillars. Okay. So, we don't have to bump it higher. And that's one thing, Yoakum, I've heard year after year, you kind of stress the importance of live seed as opposed to these sort of old school generic bushel recommendations for, for planting. And, and I don't know, it's something that I think, you know, can't reiterate enough that, uh, that that's a, an important thing to think about and to really hit some of those seeding rates you know, if you're after some of these top sort of production scenarios of top yields to you know, move past some of those old school recommendations. So anyways, uh, there's a question here about uh, drought stress on winter wheat in the Central Plains and Western areas. How serious is it? No idea, but we do know that it dies at least, it's like a cat that dies at least seven times and then still comes back. <laughs> All right, so something that just popped in here. Let's see here. If you shouldn't plant after corn, is there any effects with planting corn after small grains? What is the typical rotation schedule? That it, so, so the nicest data set we have is basically the basis for uh, the spreadsheet that Jared talked about. There is a difference uh, of where you put the small grains in. Um, but the biggest savings uh, for, that you have, the biggest rotational effect is not necessarily, uh, is it, a pretty obvious one. I should make it simple. Stored water. Corn is a heavy water user and you are saving up moisture uh, because you're harvesting that small grains earlier. And if you don't put a cover crop or, a, you know, a warm season grass in there to use up that water, it will be available for next year's corn crop. Uh, 
And that's one where they have really both iterations, the corn after soybeans in a three-way rotation and the corn after, uh, after wheat. And uh, that's where there is a, the, the difference really is coming in after a small grain where there's less water uh, being used, you know, in the long run. There's, there are some other rotation type things that could be benefic- beneficial there as well. But, you know, the other thing that always comes up with that then is, okay, so some of these longer rotation uh, studies have shown that corn does better after a small grain, maybe because of water. What about if we plant a cover crop? Because that's, you know, especially in Southern Minnesota, um, you know, a lot of folks that are planting small grains are doing it for something else too. You know, they maybe need some straw or they want to plant a cover crop to harvest for forage or something like that. And that's where we really don't know. I mean, if those cover crops are utilizing some of that water, obviously that some of those benefits are, are going to be minimized. But if you can plant a cover crop by, you know, early August, you know, and you need forage, you can easily get a couple tons of, of biomass per acre, which I think that benefit probably trumps the, uh, you know, the, the slight yield benefit due to the moisture saving. So there's a lot of other kind of variables, I guess, that go into that. But. So Jared, one thing that Bill Halfman, our, our colleague from Wisconsin, weighed in here in regards to using fungicide uh, in the small grain that you're going to harvest or forage to, to make sure to pay attention to some of those labels to you're able to cut it on a, when you want to cut it and be able to feed it. So just a Something, another little wrinkle in that whole world. Yeah, and that, I, that was in my head, actually, as I was talking about that, and I forgot to mention it, so thanks for pointing that out. Um, whenever you're utilizing any of these things, whether it's fungicides or when you get into this whole cover crop discussion and using that as forage, you know, these darn pesticide labels uh, are kind of our first step in figuring out what we can legally do. Um, so in this case, you know, with, uh, you know, pre-harvest intervals for fungicides, I don't remember what some of those are off the top of my head, but in many cases, I think you can make them work with some of those later timings. But, um, you know, that's where if you are going to plant some of these cover crop, especially mixes after small grains, as soon as you put some of the more obscure cover crops in there, like the brassicas, you know, the turnips, radishes, or any clovers, um, you know, you almost have to look at some of the soybean or corn herbicides that were used the year before first, because some of those that we use, especially in Southern Minnesota have, you know, 18 month, two year intervals to some of these um, more obscure crops, just because they're not on the label, you know, you kind of default to that other crop label. And that's one of the reasons why these forage sort of cover crops work better a lot of times with the after a small grain, because, you know, if we can just use 2,4-D or bromoxanil or, um, you know, even some of the other products, as long as there's not the ALS inhibitors in there, if you, if you've got, uh, you know, resistant wild oats or something like that, a lot of times we can get away with that. Um, and they, and those herbicides are a little bit friendlier for that. Same goes for planting alfalfa after a small grain, you know, some of those with the ALS inhibitors in them, you know, would not allow alfalfa to be planted after a small grain in the summertime. So, you know, it's really comes down to, you know, looking at those labels and, you know, as we move, use more pre's and residuals, you know, these labels get more and more complicated to figure out what we can actually use. Jared, are there other things you want to mention with regards to weed control and small grains and, and things to think about? I know there were some, some questions, some things about water hemp after harvest or pre-harvest uh, control. And uh, what are some of your kind of main points as far as weed control and small grain production? Yeah, so this kind of goes back to some of my grad school work where we worked on, uh, you know, resistant giant ragweed and weed control in these different rotations. And, you know, a lot of folks, you know, on the call here, certainly today are probably dealing with resistant ragweeds, you know, resistant water hemp, and and some of these other resistant weeds, you know, that become really challenging to control, especially in soybeans and corn production. And, you know, a lot of them are those, those summer annuals that, that come up in the spring, you know, they start coming up in early May, you know, into, into early June. And with a small grain, especially winter cereals are even better, but, you know, you plant them early in April and, you know, by that mid-May timeframe, hopefully, all goes well you've got a good nice canopy developing that really is going to kind of uh kind of outcompete some of those weeds so there's a lot of weed control sort of benefits with that but then um you know making sure we we get on top of those uh during the growing season you know use use products that work well on whichever weeds you have um you know we have different modes of action we can use you know in some cases 24d works works fine but if we're using a lot of 24d with the enlist crops in the rotation you know maybe diversify that with uh, some of the other uh contact herbicides, um, you know, the bromoxynil type products, um, and really keeping those weeds at least suppressed so that we can get them harvested without having to use a pre-harvest aid. And then, uh, and then think about seed production. So, you know, using ragweed as the example and, and water hemp, you know, giant ragweed seeds only last a couple of years, you know, over 95% of them are gone in two years. 
Uh, water hemp is just a touch longer lived, but uh, you can get over 95% of them gone in three or four years. So if we can prevent seed production, you know, there is some light at the end of the tunnel, even though, you know, 5% of a trillion could still be a lot. Uh, but um, so then after you get that small green harvested, make sure you prevent seed production with tillage or uh, herbicides. You know, you can use uh, Paraquat or, uh, you know, uh, Sharpen or 240, Dicamba, Roundup, depending on which weeds you have. A lot of times it's, you know, things like water hemp that might have germinated later under the canopy and just kind of hung around until the, the small grains reach maturity and come through. Um, so making sure you don't let those weeds go to seed um, is going to be kind of key to, to helping, helping manage that seed bank, you know, but then if you're going to plant a cover crop, you know, some of those options are going to limit you. you know, if you're going to plant certain cover crops, you've got to wait, you know, a week or two after you plant, you know, spray 240 or Roundup or different things. Um, so, you know, keeping in mind uh, some of those restrictions as well, if you're going to harvest them as, as forage or graze them. If it's just as green manure, you can do, do whatever you want, really. So good answers there. Uh, one question that came, came in, and I don't know if there's a good answer for this. Uh, it's talking about rye versus uh, oats in a three crop rotation, if there's any benefits for, for weed control. Uh, and they're saying the allopathic effects of, of rye and when it decomposes and, and uh, anybody so doing work on that or? No, but. There is some uh, uh, USDA ARS has a group that is actually selecting for stronger allelopathic effects in rye. They have a really interesting uh, protocol to select for higher allelopathic effects. Um, to answer the question that was asked, um, if the weeds are established, so your winter annuals have already established, the, the, the rye isn't necessarily going to, the allelopathic effect isn't going to prevent those from continuing. So, and this, the same is true in oats. If your winter annuals aren't destroyed by tillage, they're going to be there. Um, both, you know, are very competitive in shading out any summer annuals. And I don't think there's probably a lot of difference. If I, just by seeing what I've, what I've seen that the, the challenge is if you have a little bit more open canopy, which if would happen, for instance, if you would go to 10 inch or 15 inch row spacing on your oats, you may see more grass, um, grass summer annuals like your foxtails in your barnyard grass, because they'll, they'll wait until you indeed see some heat units on that ground and if, the, if there is no shading, uh, the rye allelopathic effect might keep those in check where the oats won't. Jared, you want to add to that? Just, just understanding a little bit of what I know of the physiology and of, of the different weeds. Yeah, I mean, that's an area that is kind of ongoing with research. You know, it is an interesting, interesting factor and um, you know, it just kind of goes into that whole integrated, you know, weed management thing, right? So we got all kinds of different things that are going into managing weeds. You know, it's early planting date, dense canopies. You know, in some cases we get that allelopathic effect, you know, harvest date, seed management, all those things. And I think, you know, even if the benefits are minimal and we don't understand them fully, if there are some benefits there, I think that, you know, they kind of go into that whole, uh, whole kind of package, I guess. Um, and that's just it. I mean, in many cases with the winter cereals, you know, cereal rye, especially, um, we don't, really need herbicides in many cases. Um, so, which is kind of a nice thing considering, you know, it's kind of all we have in many cases to, to manage weeds besides some cultivation and soybeans and, uh, and corn. So. Excellent. One guy, you guys, one question here on Triticale came in. I don't know if you want to make any mention there. I know it's, do you have, it's just a, if you've done much with, with, yeah, we so so I it, when we started up the rye variety trials, um, I automatically also included winter triticale in the variety trials. Uh, so we have some data on some European winter triticales and now a little bit of some U.S. germplasm. So we have some variety data on the winter triticales. There are also summer triticales, and I've done some work of those in the past. Uh, most of those are uh, forage types. The triticales, the winter triticales, yield can yield very well. 
Um, they're more closer in winter hardiness to the winter weeds. And so no-till production is pretty much a given. Okay, excellent. Um, that said, I did post a link in the chat box. We're gonna close the end here. Uh, uh, there is a uh, website you can go to if you miss one of these or wanna re-listen to the, the session. We'll have this posted in about a week after it goes through a transcription process. Uh, as well as the future sessions, we run this winter program through March. Uh, so there are other opportunities coming up here in the next uh, handful of weeks. I know uh, we're getting into some insect topics uh, in the next couple of weeks, I believe. So uh, be interesting to see some of that discussion. Uh, but with that, thank you everybody for attending, providing questions. Thanks to our speakers for kind of helping facilitate the discussion today. Uh, and you'll be asked a short three question survey as you check out today. So uh, please take some time to enter that and give us some feedback. Uh, we really appreciate hearing that uh, so that we can, you know, better develop things in the future. And thanks again to our, our co-sponsors, uh, both Minnesota Corn and Soybean Research and Promotion Councils. So thanks to everybody.